Welcome to Lafayette Church of Christ. We're glad that you're here. You're in the adult class. We are studying the book of 1 Samuel. We'll be in chapter 30 this evening. There are many who are uh, under doctor's care, and we would like to pray for them. But if there's anybody in particular that you'd like to pray for at this time, we will do it. Let me know who it is. Red, how you feeling? Pray for you anyway. <laughs> Way it works. Marie uh, Eaton, I think, is still in the hospital. She was as of yesterday. But uh, So I'd been texting her and stuff, but she didn't even have her phone when I talked to her yesterday. So I think the battery went dead. And uh, Anyway, long story. One of her granddaughters were up there, and I got to talk to them. And uh, so I really don't know. I can't tell you what's wrong with her because I don't know. And I don't know where she's going from the hospital. I just don't know. But we can pray for her. And as I get any information on her at all, I'll, uh, I'll relay that to you. And Frank's been trying to uh, stay in contact with her too. We just, got, we just don't know what's going to happen to her, do we, Frank? We just, anyway, we keep waiting. So we're praying for her as well. Anybody else you'd like to add to the list? I didn't know if that was a, <laughs> not a signal. Okay. Let's go to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you for the great blessings we have. We thank you for life. We thank you for the way that you have given us a way to make a living and that we're able to use that money and those materials in a good way. We pray, our Father, we're always mindful of others who are needful and always, Father, to be mindful of the great sacrifice that was given to us on Calvary. We pray that we live in a way that exemplifies the confession that we made and we pray for all others to be able to come to a knowledge of the truth and be saved as well our father we pray for red porter and his grandmother pray for both of them to be in good health we pray for the doctors who take care of them also for marie eaton we pray for the facility where she's at pray for all those nurses that make decisions on her behalf and we pray that uh, she is able to go somewhere good and we pray that we're able to uh, stay in track with her Father, we thank you for uh, the great blessing we have in your word, and we pray that as we study, we gain the lessons we should, that we can fortify our faith, and to be able to help others as well. Our Father, we pray for this country. We know there are many things that are not godly, and our Father, we pray that in some way, in your way, that there would be something that would get our attention, and that we would turn back to you. Father, we're sorry for all those who have decided to leave you, for those who mock you, and we understand, our Father, that ignorance sometimes on behalf of humans is, is the reason for a lot of this. Help us, our Father, as we study, gain the lesson we should, be able to help others also. In the name of Jesus Christ, do we pray. Amen. We're in 1 Samuel chapter 30. Chapter 30. All these chapters are great, I say it, but they just all are. The more you dig into them, the more you learn. Um, every time I study them, I always learn extra things, you know, things that really uh, just make you feel better about studying here. On your papers, I gave you, um, if you look at the paper that you have, I gave you a little bit of background on the Amalekites. It's always interesting to know a little bit about these people when we read about them. Um, the Amalekites, um, the Philistines, well, I'll try to work up a paper on the Philistines as well. They were the descendants of Amalek. Uh, the grandson of Esau, they were a nomadic people inhabiting the southern peninsula of Sinai and the wilderness between the southern portion of Palestine and Egypt. They had a particular affinity with Egypt. Um, you'll see them associated with Egypt a lot, and they seem to have um, a friendship kind of between them. In fact, in this chapter, you'll see that there's an Egyptian that's going to be found who was a servant of uh, an Amalekite. Israel's first battle was fought with them at Rephidim, on the way to Sinai, there were several other encounters with them, and they were always unpleasant. During the time of the judges, the Amalekites joined forces with the Midianites to invade and oppress Israel. They suffered a crushing defeat by Saul in 1 Samuel 15, and were further suppressed by David in this chapter, as we're going to read about. Okay, let's go. Chapter 30, 1 Samuel chapter 30, verse 1. Now it happened, when David and his men came to Ziklag, where had they been? 
Yeah. Remember, they were lined up with the Philistines, and they were over in Gath, you know. By the way, it's about a 65 to 70 mile trip from Gath to come back to Ziklag. Keep that in mind. Have you ever walked two or three miles? I have. To the gas station? That'll hit you later if you're going home. Or have you ever walked five miles, six miles? I used to walk a lot, and I could walk a mile in 20 minutes, an easy pace. That's an easy pace. Can you imagine walking 65 miles or 70 miles? It averages somewhere in there. That's how far they had to walk from Gath, where they were rejected from being in the army there with the Philistines, all the way to Ziklag. Keep that in mind. Now it happened when David and his men came to Ziklag on the third day that the Amalekites had invaded the south and Ziklag, attacked Ziklag, and burned it with fire, and had taken captive the women and those who were there from small to great. They did not kill anyone, but carried them away and went their way. Okay, let's just talk here for a second. Whenever David raided the Amalekites, he would lay them to waste. He would kill them. I was trying to think, didn't we have a place like that in, uh, oh yeah, in uh, chapter 27, I just put my eyes on it. Chapter 27, we already studied, uh, verse 7. Now at the time David dwelt in the country of the Philistines, it was one full year and four months. David and his men went and raided the Gersh Gershites, the Gershites, and the Amalekites. This is what he did. David attacked the land and left neither man or woman alive. All right, so we got that in our memory. We remember that. Remember we read that? We talked about how horrible it is to imagine going in and wipe people out like that. Now here, a bit of a conundrum. The Amalekites have invaded now. They burned Ziklag. They took captive all the women all the from small to great, and they did not kill anyone. You know, in human thinking, this is a good way to get back at David's, kill all his people. It's not what they did. Let's keep that in mind as well. So David and his men came to the city. There it was, burned with fire, and their wives, their sons, and their daughters had been taken captive. I'm going to ask you something else here. It's on the question, but be thinking about it. After you plunder a city, you take everything that's there. Why do you burn it? Be thinking about it. We'll ask it again. Then David and the people who were with him lifted up their voices and wept, and they had no more power to weep. I'll ask you this. Have you ever cried to the point you couldn't cry anymore? It happens. You just cry yourself out. And David's two wives, Ahinoam, the Jezreelitess, and Abigail, the widow of Nabal, the Carmelite, had been taken captive. Now David was greatly distressed, for the people spoke of stoning him, because the soul of all the people was grieved, every man for his sons and his daughters. Is that going to help anything, though? That won't help anything. And isn't it common whenever people get mad about something that's happened that the leaders are going to be <laughs> held, <clears throat> held accountable? And that's the way it still is. It's just kind of a natural human response. He's talking about stoning David because of what he allowed to happen. But David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. And this is a, a curious statement in a way because you're thinking to yourself, faced with the people turning against you, and you've already got loss here. Your two wives are gone. The city's burned. And now the people are talking about stoning you. But David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. So I'm thinking that this next verse explains what he did. David said to Abiathar, the priest, so what's David going to do? Pray. He's going to talk to God. Whenever things are bad, they're as bad as you think they can get, and maybe they just got worse, you go to God, don't you? And this is what he does. This is one of the, one of the great things about David, and we're talking about him being a man for God's own heart. He always comes to God when there's trouble. Always wants to inquire of God. I want to find out what God says about this. To the point that David would even make this statement, if I'm the one that's at fault, and if I'm deserving of death, so be it, if it's God's will. So he goes to Abiathar the priest, Ahimelech's son. Bring the ephod here to me. And Abiathar brought the ephod to David. So David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I pursue this troop? Shall I overtake them? Two questions with the same possible result here. And he answered him, 
Pursue, for you shall surely overtake them without fail, and without fail recover all. So be thinking in your minds again, because I want to uh, expound on this week to our questions. Why have they taken the trouble to take possessions and things from David, but especially to take all the people alive? There's got to be a reason for it. So David went. He and the 600 men who were with him, remember these 600 men, they are brutal. They are warriors. Went with him, to the, and they came to the brook Basor, where those who were left behind, uh, where those who stayed were left behind. Uh, but David pursued he and 400 men, for 200 stayed behind, who were so weary that they could not cross the brook Besor. All right, so let's talk about why this occurs. They had just traveled probably double march as fast as they could from Gath to get home to Ziklag. That's 65 to 70 miles. It just depends on how you measure this when you look at your map. Within the same day, they find out that Ziklag has been wiped out. They're all torn up about this, and who wouldn't be, right? David finds out from God, yes, pursue them, and you'll overtake them and get your stuff back. And David says, let's go. I might be one of the first ones to say, I'm tired. But at the same time, if they've got my family, I want to go get them back. What do you think the thing is that drives David to say, let's go, let's go get them? That's it. God has already said, if you pursue them, you'll get your stuff back. Go get them. Like saying, sick them to a dog, in it? Sick them, go get them. And so David's full of energy now. Yeah, they, they've crossed this 65, 70 mile terrain here, and now they're ready to go again? Yeah. This is really going to test the stamina of these men. So 400 end up going with him. 200 stay back. We find out they stay back with the supplies or the baggage, or we call it the stuff. Then they found an Egyptian in the field, verse 11, and brought him to David, and they gave him bread, and he ate, and they let him drink water. Now, you're asking yourself, see, why did they find this abandoned Egyptian, this young man, he's abandoned, starving to death? They gave him a piece of cake of figs and two clusters of raisins. You know what that would do for your blood sugar? Bring it up. Make you feel better. So when he had eaten, his strength came back, see? For he had eaten no bread or drunk any water for three days and three nights. And David said to him, to whom do you belong, and where are you from? He said, I am a young man from Egypt, a servant of an Amalekite, and my master left me behind because three days ago I fell sick. All right, I'm going to stop a second. This tells you how the Amalekites are. You got a servant, you got sick, throw him out there in the wilderness and let him fend for himself. Let him die. No use to me. That's what we're looking at here. This is their mindset. This is how they are. Now, God has told them early on, even uh, in the book of Joshua, uh, to go and get these Amalekites and get them out of there. You know, do some surgery here and get rid of them. But it hasn't happened. And here David is fighting them again. Saul put a pretty good uh, blow on them, but um, David's going to have to finish it. So that's the way they treat their, their servants. Um. We made an invasion of the southern area of the Cherethites, and that's part of the um, Philistine area, in the territory which belongs to Judah and of the southern area of Caleb, and we burned Ziklag with fire. And I was cringe when I read that because I was thinking if David knows that he was with them and burned Ziklag with fire, he might take some vengeance out on him. That's not what happens. David said, and I want you to spot something else. There's providence in this. Right now, David doesn't know where the Amalekites are. The terrain they crossed wouldn't leave much tracks and all. And how's he going to find them? Providence. David said to him, Can you take me down to this troop? He said, Swear to me by God that you will neither kill me nor deliver me into the hands of my master, and I will take you down to this troop. And when they had... So this, this sick servant that this Amalekite cast aside is going to be their undoing. And when he had brought him down, there they were, spread out all over the land, eating and drinking and dancing because of all the great spoil which they had taken from the land of the Philistines. 
and from the land of Judah. Then, so I'm picturing this. I'm picturing this as they're drunk, they've eaten, you know, makes you sleepy. They they've been dancing to celebrate. Who knows what all else they've been doing? They're heathen people, and now they're laid out all over the place. Probably some problems here too, you know. And so they can't get to their weapons quick. They can't unify quick. They're spread out all over the land. So David attacked them from twilight until the evening of the next day. Not a man of them escaped, comma, except 400 young men who rode on camels and fled. You know, every time I read about uh, camels, I always wonder, I've never ridden a camel. Has anybody ever, here ever ridden a camel? I haven't either. I, it'd be an experience, wouldn't it? So David recovered all that the Amalekites had carried away, and David rescued his two wives, and nothing of theirs was lacking, either small or great, sons or daughters, spoil, or anything which they had taken from them. David recovered all. Then David took all the flocks and the herds they had driven before those other livestock and said, this is David's spoil. So he's taken extra uh, loot here from them. And it's a great bit, and we'll see about in just a minute. Now David came to the 200 men who had been so weary that they could not follow David, whom they also made to stay at the brook Basor. So they went out to meet David, to meet the people who were with him. And when David came near the people, he greeted them. Then all the wicked men, and I don't think this means all the men, but certain men in this group that came back with the 400 fighters went with David. It says wicked and worthless men. Of those who went with David answered and said, because they did not go with us, we will not give them any of the spoil that we have recovered except for every man's wife and children that they may lead them away and depart. And this means get out of our group. You're out. We're kicking you out. You're not going to be among the valiant anymore. That's what they said. Verse 23. But David said, My brethren, you shall not do so with what the Lord has given us who has preserved us and delivered into our hand the truth that came against us. For who will heed you in this matter? In other words, David's saying, who's going to listen to that? Who's going to give in to that? It's like, uh, you know, who's the boss here? Who has the authority to say that? You men? You few men? You don't like the fact that they stayed here with the stuff because they were tired and you felt like you went out and fought so you did all the work so they don't get anything. Who made that rule? Actually, that rule is already in place. There's a place in Deuteronomy and there's a place in um, Joshua where he exercises the same thing. But as his part is who goes down into the battle, so shall his part be who stays by the supplies. They shall share alike. And there's the rule. That there's a ruling. This is the way it's going to be. Those who stayed here with the stuff, they get just like the ones who went out and fought and took it. Now, I'm sure those men are thinking, that's not fair. <laughs> but isn't it also an important job to stay with the supplies? It has to be. I mean, somebody's got to guard the stuff. So it was from that day forward that he made a statute and an ordinance for Israel to this day. Now, when David came to Ziklag, he sent some of the spoil to the elders of Judah, to his friends, saying, here's a present to you from the spoil of the enemies of the Lord. To those who are in Bethel, those who were in Ramoth of the south, those who were in Jatir, those who were in Aror, those who were in Zipmoth, those who were in Eshtemia or Eshtemoa, those who were in Rechel, those who were in the cities of the Jeremelites, those who were in the cities of the Kenites, those who were in Hormah, those who were in the Korashan, those who were in Athlach, those who were in Hebron, and to all the places where David and himself and his men were accustomed to rove. Verses 26 through 30, 31 have a purpose. We'll get into that when we get into our questions. Let's go to the questions. So what happened in, in Ziklag when David and his men were in Gath? Yeah, the city got attacked and burned. So um, I, I'm going to number four right here real quick. Why do you think the Amalekites burned the city? I mean, they already looted it and took the people. Why did they burn it? What? Yeah. Yeah, so maybe they won't be attacking us anymore. Come after us. 
What else? Yeah. This is a slap in the face, isn't it? It's an insult. We're going to burn your city. We took all your stuff, now we burned your city. And you have some good ideas here. Burning the city gives uh, the men no headquarters, really. They're going to have to rebuild what's been burned. But first now, they got to go out and they got to get back what they, what they lost and try to recover that. And uh, you'll see this a lot of times. Now, people will say, well, you can't, you can't burn stones. But if you burn what is burnable and you heat the stones up, it will render them um, no good for building. It makes them brittle. So that's why a lot of times even stone cities were um, heated and set on fire like this. So yeah, I think it was. Uh, there's a lot of reasons here, but kind of spiteful, you know. Let's go ahead and burn this place. Number two, what was taken from Ziklag? All the people, all the possessions and things, they emptied it out. And then this next uh, phrase in number three, the Amalekites, it says, killed no one but carried them away. Now, you see, in my way of thinking here, they could have been so mad at David because David, time after time, has attacked them and killed women and children. Here's the perfect time when nobody's at home. None of the men are there. The army's not there. Go in there and wipe the people out. Pay David back. They didn't do it. Is it curious? Or do you think there's something else here? Yeah, that'd been the end of them. Say it again. Yeah. Maybe they could sell them as slaves, make some profit. It is curious that they didn't kill anybody. And I'm wondering if God's hand is in this. You know? We don't know. But we're looking at this. It's odd behavior for them. But there's a lot of reasons, as, as we've been hearing. A lot of reasons that it could have been done. Maybe they could make some profit off of selling them. And probably they would have sold them into Egypt. Because we know that um, the Amalekites in Egypt had an affinity with, with one another. So uh, that could have been the possibility. And this uh, servant, this slave that was uh, an Egyptian that told them where the Amalekites were, told David where, would stand as evidence for that. It's curious behavior. Number five, so how did this raid affect David and his men? Well, listen to what it says. Look at what it says. How, how much did they cry? Until they couldn't cry anymore. It's cried out. <sighs> it can happen. And boy, when you get to that point, I'll tell you this about tears. In a funeral I did uh, of somebody that was a whole lot more important than I am. But, uh, so I did a study because I was going to talk about tears in the funeral. And I did a study on tears and from the medical community and scientific community. We learned that tears have chemicals in them. So Diane, you, you stop me if, I'm, if I cross on the wrong territory here. But that tears have chemicals in them. And these help the brain kind of get flushed of those chemicals, which actually helps you to start heal. You ever heard that, Diane? No. Oh. So it's good to cry. When you're in a position where you need to cry, then you cry because it's actually a healing thing. Isn't that interesting how God made us? But you can get to the point where you can cry out. I mean, you, you're just out of tears. And then do you notice what happens? A decision has to be made. Now we've got to get to work. We cried out. Now, we're going to take some action. Let's find out what we can do. And that's when David talked to the Lord. Let's keep going. Oh, so what did the... Number six. The two wives taken captive of David's wives. You remember their names? Yeah, very good. And the people were upset to, about David, and they spoke about punishing David by doing what? Stoning him. You know, we read about stoning in the uh, Old Testament, even in the New Testament, too. It's a horrible thing to do or to witness. I'm not witness of stoning. Um, but it's, a, it's, it's this. People circle somebody, and usually they have, they'll throw somebody in a lower place like a ditch or something, and they'll take stones. We're not talking about rocks. Wouldn't that take forever? He got rocked to death. Stones. You take stones, and, and you take them, and you, if you can get them over your head you know, to throw them, and you throw them, your intent is to break bones. It is to kill. That's what they're wanting to do to David. 
They wouldn't have ordinarily ever said anything like that against David. But their hearts broke. Their family, their children. Now I'll tell you, we'll respond like that. You mess with our family and our children, you see what happens with us. We get emotional real quick. And that's what these men did. They were saying this. David heard that, but then it said, uh, I'm going to uh, point number eight here. So how did David strengthen himself in the Lord? What did he do? He prayed. He went to God and he asked the priest, bring the, bring the ephod. Talk to God for me. And what two questions did David ask? Yes. Those are good questions, aren't they? Because that's what would be on my mind. Should we go after them? And if we do, will we catch them? And I like the answer of the Lord here. Pursue them, you will surely overtake them, and without fail, recover all. That's all David needed to hear. That's what he was wanting. Number, I see, uh, number 10. I already said that. Number 11. How long did they rest before they pursued the Amalekites? They didn't. They went. As soon as they got the word from God, David said, we're going. I can't imagine. because See, I'm not fit like that. <laughs> and people, back in those days, they were more fit than we are anyway because they walked everywhere. Most of, most of them walked everywhere and worked hard and all these things. But these men, again, you look at your map, you're looking at 65 to 70 miles. They just covered that that morning or within a few days. And so now that they arrive and they've got to go again and pursue them. But there's something about those 400 who were able to keep doing this and they were driven by something other than just adrenaline. They're going to get their stuff back. And they have the Word of God that they'll get it if they go. Now I like this because where salvation is concerned, God has told us we can have that. But we have to pursue it. You notice that? You have to pursue it. God says we can have it, but we have to do what God says we're supposed to do. Then we can be what God says we can be and go where God says we can go. But there's work involved here, isn't there? Because it would have been really easy. God could have said, I'm turning them around right now. I'm going to lead them right back here and here's all your stuff. He could have done that. It's not the way it was done, though. Go, pursue, overtake. Number 12. Who stayed with the supplies? So those who, those who were just worn out, those 200, they said, we just can't go. They stayed with the supplies. They still had a job to do, didn't they? And it was still a part of being beneficial to the overall group. What, did the, or, or what deal did the young Egyptian make with David? What did David want to know? Where are these Amalekites? Because he can't track them down. There's um, a lot of terrain there that's not going to be able to... They've got a head start and all this stuff. And you would think, well... Yeah, but see, another thing is they scattered, but they knew where to go to. And usually um, people like that will have this place where, you know, if we get scattered, we'll always wind up right here. And this was their safe spot. So David needs to know from this young man, where are they? So he makes a deal. What's the deal? Right. If you won't kill me and you won't give me, to, give me back to my master who will kill me, uh, I'll tell you. That's a pretty good deal, isn't it? I mean, you, David gets what he wants and the Egyptian gets what he wants. So that's good. And do you think, also, I still see the Lord's hand in this, how is it that they run across this Egyptian who knows right where they are? And this Amalekite didn't kill him, this, this uh, owner of this Egyptian didn't kill him. He just put him aside and said, see you later. Take care of yourself. And he ends up being the one that leads David to victory. Isn't that great? Number 14. What valuable information did David receive from the Egyptian? Of course, where the Amalekites were camped. And what were the Amalekites doing when David found them? Yeah, they didn't party it out really, hadn't they? <laughs> they didn't party it hardy. And here they are laying everywhere, you know, drunk and all this stuff, and thinking they're in their safe spot. And probably thinking, well, we got lookouts, you know. Well, where are they? I don't know. I think they're crashed too somewhere. 
Nobody sees them come in. So David makes a plan and says, look, let's go get them from twilight to evening. Wow. You know, isn't, I have to make a comment here, but won't that be the case when the Lord comes back that He will find some people sleeping? Some people have gone to sleep. Some people are negligent. Some people won't be watching. Some people won't be faithful. And then all of a sudden it happens. Number 16, how many Amalekites escaped David? 400 on Camelback, right? Today is? <laughs> Don't throw anything this way or that way. I can't imagine riding a camel. How could that be comfortable? Could it? Nobody knows because we never ridden one. Oh, really? <laughs> I can't imagine. One day it'll come up. One day we're going to find that picture. Yeah, one day it'll come up. Number 17, what was David's ruling on those who stayed with the supplies? That 200 stayed back with the baggage. They came back from the fight and they were victorious and brought all the stuff. And, and um, they were saying, oh, you know, the 200, you guys don't deserve to be with us anymore. You didn't go fight with us. All you did, you was tired and you stayed here with the stuff. David said, that's right. They share in the spoil just like we are. And number 18, what do you think the significance of these verses 26 through 31? And I read them, I read all the, I mean, I read them accurately, all those cities and countries, didn't I? All right, thank you. So what do you think it means here when you look at this? He comes with all this spoil. Now, by the way, he, he says this is David's spoil back in verse 20. But I don't think he kept that much of it. Because look at what all he did. He gave to this city, that city, that city. Gave, 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 gave. What was the purpose of this? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So this was not without reason, was it? It wasn't just haphazardly done. And do you think that this increases David's favor? Certainly. And doesn't it also show that he has some leadership skills? Because to be a good leader, especially in those days, you had to have a certain amount of political uh, savvy too. How to make people happy. How to get people on your side, you know. Which still happens today, but uh, there it is right there in verses 26 through 31. So any observations from what we looked at? Anything you wanted to bring in here? And that's, that's really hoofing it. You know, these are men we're talking about. We say men, these are men. Yes, Miss Jamie. You, so he would have had also, by the virtue of having that, he would have had the, the Urim and the Thummim, which had those jewels in it that the priest would wear. And they had, there was 12 near precious stones, and that was a communication device. And that's what they used to be able to talk with God. And the priest, the priest would be the ones that would have that. Um, I think later we're going to see David get a hold of that too. So coming up in the next, uh, next book in 2 Samuel. Anything else? Thanks for being a great class.
Good evening, everyone. It sure is good to have everyone here tonight. We are thankful for your presence. We do have a couple of visitors here that are mostly family, but uh, we'll still call you visitors. We're glad that you are uh, with us. We do have a lot of folks on our prayer list. I'd like to bring uh, those names up to you right now. Quite a lengthy list. We've got a few additions and updates as well. Keep David paid in your prayers. And uh, don't forget him to look at your cross side because he's driving that machine with his eyes now. And if he looks at your cross side, he might just run over. <laughs> isn't, isn't technology amazing that he's able to steer that thing with his eyes? That's another source of amazing. We're going to keep Angela McCauley in her prayers. She's still in Park Side Room 111. Uh, Marvin Sintel, keep her in your prayers. She continues to heal up. Uh, Marlon Cow, he is going to have a PET scan this Friday uh, to try to confirm what may or may not have happened. They just uh, got to check him out. Hopefully, we'll uh, have some good news. So let's pray that this PET scan on Friday brings good news. Terry Jackson has had her heart test rescheduled for uh, Wednesday, May 29th. Marie Eason is still in uh, Memorial Hospital, room 103. So keep her in your prayers. Keep Wanda Thompson in your prayers. She's having health issues. Continue to pray for Jenny Wallers. Continue with ups and downs with her. Also, Alexa Bird, the five-year-old, uh, has some neurological disorders. Lisa Little, that's the door knocking contact, uh, recovering from a knee replacement or having a knee replacement. So please pray for Lisa Little. Also, Lisa Wofford, uh, still dealing with a lot of infection and problems with uh, hip replacement. Uh, got to get that infection cleared up so she can have that hip replacement redone. Ken and Hilda Stevens are homebound and having health issues. Bob and Becky Daddy also are homebound and have, are in the nursing home and having health issues. And Becky Daddy asked also uh, if we could pray for her friend Marilyn who's home from the hospital. So Becky Daddy's friend Marilyn also has requested a prayer. I didn't get an update on... Uh, Gary Hughes, uh, Kelly's uncle. Everything went well. Kelly's uncle, Kerry, had a heart surgery this past Monday and recovered from that. Keep that in your prayers. We also had uh, a friend of Francis Sintel's little 13-year-old Bryson back in the hospital and having issues. Keep Bryson in your prayers. Uh, I'd like to add to the prayer list tonight, my brother, Rod, he, he is going to have surgery on his neck uh, on the 24th. So if you will keep him in your prayers, I would appreciate that. Uh, we we'll continue to keep Red in her prayers. He uh, said he had a pretty good day today, and today's his birthday. So if you haven't told him his birthday, you can do that. I told him he looked pretty good to be 80. Team singing May 19th in Dunlap. That'll be at 2:30 Sunday. Uh, group 2 will be signing compassion cards after worship Sunday evening. This coming Sunday evening. Don't forget about our uh, church picnic. That's May 25th. It's going to be at Sloppy Floyd State Park. The sign-up sheets for the food are posted. So all the main dishes are going to be provided and the sides are going to be uh, what we need to bring. And that's detailed out on that list. So if you look down at the bottom, it's got a list of what's going to be provided and uh, check boxes for what you can bring. And if you bring something that's not on the list, just write down what you're bringing so everybody else will know what to expect. Fellowship meal, Sunday, May 26th, following morning worship. And our afternoon worship will be at 2 p.m. following that. Still have the basket out in the foyer for diapers and wipes for Morgan and Adam. For their baby girl, Caroline Ash, this June 10th. Our youth led worship coming up will be on June 2nd for uh, evening worship. Uh, men's breakfast for June is Saturday, June 1st. Vacation Bible School starts Monday, June 3rd and goes through Thursday, June 6th. And we're going to have a PBS meeting uh, after morning worship this Sunday. So plan on staying just for a little short while just to make sure everything's lined up and everybody's got the best in the road for that. So PBS meeting after morning worship this Sunday. 
bridal shower for Anna Beth and Brandon on June 9th at 2.30 p.m. here at the building. So plan on supporting them with that. And their wedding invitation is set back on the bulletin board somewhere. So uh, make sure you check that out. You stay at Pleasant Grove, Saturday, June 22nd at 3 p.m. Speaker is Kyle Butt. Uh, the youth activity sign up sheet is on the bulletin board as well. And don't forget, May 24th, 8 p.m. at the Lafayette High School football field. I think it's going to be graduating, and she'd love for you to come support her there. So, the announcements I have at this time. The proper time, our closing prayer will be led by Josh Jackson. Uh, we're going to have our brief evangelism training video. Caleb will leave us in song. Well, good morning. It's Friday. That means it's time for Reaching the Lost Success Strategies. Bible studies are your third step in the evangelism model. Now, you don't start with a Bible study. Now, remember, if you try to do that, you're going to scare people off. They're going to think you're a religious fanatic. You're going to close doors. There's a process to get to the study. Contact prospecting Bible studies. I want to talk about that third step, that Bible study step. And I would like to discuss this very briefly this morning. Does it matter? Does it matter if a one-study method? Now, there's a lot of lures in a good evangelist tackle box. I got a lot of lures in my tackle box. So if I go fishing and I, I throw out my line, and for several hours I don't get any bite, I'm not going to keep the same lure on my line. I'm going to switch lures. People are different. And not every circumstance requires the same type of equipment or tools. So that's why in our, our seminars, we teach you several different tools, and we suggest several even additional studies that, you know, carry, but traditionally have been very effective. Now, one of the tools that we mentioned is does it matter? I don't spend a lot of time on does it matter. In fact, as part of our advanced training, it's a one-study booklet. The one-study booklet is designed for unique situations or to give you a little bit extra punch when they don't respond to back to the Bible. Let me explain when you need to do does it matter. If you're using back to the Bible in a study and they don't obey the gospel, what do you need to do next? Well, you never say this is your last study. See, if a study comes to an end, it won't be because I've done it. It'll be because they have ended it. So I know this is difficult, but don't say the last study. Say in our next study, therefore, they don't know when the last study is going to occur. See, the best close to any Bible study is never close. So I don't want to close the study to close us in the baptistry unless they just give up. I'm going to continue to teach them. But if you get to the end of Back to the Bible and they have not yet obeyed the gospel, what do you do? Well, just jump to Does It Matter? Does It Matter summarizes Back to the Bible very well, makes a few different points. It's excellent in the close. If you've not seen the close of Back to the Bible, you can actually go to worldvideobibleschool.org. And you can watch me do the close. We filmed the entire study. If you want to learn how to do a close, watch me do that close. I think there's four or five closings in that particular study. So if someone's finished back to the Bible and they've not obeyed the gospel, that means they just need help across the finish line. We've got to figure out what is it that's keeping them from that final obedience. doesn't matter. It's really good for that. Also, if you've got someone in your pews that's been sitting there for years, Maybe decades, never obeyed the gospel. Now, it's not the preaching that, that is the reason they not obey. We realize that some people just need that extra help. They need the personal Bible study. So, does it matter? It's excellent when it comes to helping that person cross the finish line. Now, when else do I do does it matter? Well, if I'm doing a campaign and I may not have time to do three studies, I may use does it matter. If I'm dealing with someone who's sickly. Maybe they're towards the end of their life. And it's very evident. They know it. You know it. You don't know how long they're going to be with you. I use it. doesn't matter. Maybe I'm dealing with somebody who their attention span is just very short for whatever reason. And I don't I don't I don't have the, the, the luxury of, of three studies. I do the one study, doesn't matter. Heavy on new convert teaching and follow-up. So does it matter kind of fills a little gap and helps you with people who may not respond as well to the back of the Bible, 
you need to have different lures in your tackle box. So I would encourage you to take a look. It doesn't matter. Probably on your evangelism table at your local congregation, you go through our school, they have that table. Those tools are there. Maybe if you've not already, take your congregation through Does It Matter. If you've done back to the Bible, now train them how to use another tool. You should never stop your evangelism training. Evangelism is not a one-time training event. It is a continuous event. It is a culture that's within your congregation. And we've got to make sure that our members know what out there and how to use it. Does it matter? It really does. I hope that you'll take a look at it very soon. Thanks for for joining us for this week. We will glorify the King of Kings. We will glorify the Lamb. We will glorify the Lord of Lords, who is the great I am. Hallelujah to the Hallelujah to the Lamb. Hallelujah to the Lord of Lords, who is the great I Am. I want to look at two thoughts from the book of Nehemiah. Look at the life of Nehemiah, the things that were going on in those days, but he was definitely a life of the day. Nehemiah chapter 1, we see where Nehemiah was, the situation, and a friend comes to him and tells him the situation back in Jerusalem. First four verses read, the words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah, and it came to pass in the month Chisholm, in the twentieth year, as I was in the the palace, that Hananiah, one of my brethren, came, he and certain men of Judah. And I asked them concerning the Jews that had escaped, which were left to the captivity, and concerning Jerusalem. And they said unto me, the remnant that are left from the captivity, there in the province, are in great affliction and reproach. All Jerusalem and also was broken down, the gates there were burned with fire. And it came to pass when I heard these words, I sat down and wept, mourned certain days and fasted, and prayed before the God of heaven. So Nehemiah being in captivity, he wanted to know the state of Jerusalem, what was going on back there. And he found out because of the Christ, because of the men. Situation that was there. The remainder of chapter 1, him I praise God. I praise God for the forgiveness of the Jewish nation, for the things that they had brought reproach against God. And he also prayed that he would have good favor and have mercy with the king. So he goes to the king, chapter 2. He grants him that mercy that he did so fervently to pray to God for. Verse, uh, get down to verse 17, 18. And he has gone back to Jerusalem. He has come out by night and examined the situation there in Jerusalem. It's in the wall. He, he hadn't told anyone of his story that he is about to undertake. He comes to the people that are left there in Jerusalem in verses 17 and 18. He says, Then said I unto them, See the distress that we are in. 
how Jerusalem lies in waste, the gates thereof are burned with fire. Come and let us build up the wall of Jerusalem, that we be no more of your place. And I told them of the hand of my God, which was good upon me, as also the king's words that he had spoken unto me. And they said, Let us rise up and build. So they strengthened their hands for this good work. Their mind was set to do the work. They had no doubts in their mind because of what Nehemiah had told them. How God had chosen favor, how the king had chosen favor. They were ready for the word. Look over and look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Read verses 8 through 13. You see that we're all engaged in the work spiritually. This, this building of the law is spiritual. Building, but we are to be engaged in work in a, in a spiritual way. And in verse 8, <clears throat> Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry, ye are God's building. According to the grace of God which is given unto me as a wise master builder. Paul considered himself to be a wise master builder, someone who was skilled, someone who was highly trained to be that master builder. I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. Let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. The foundation of our labors is Jesus Christ. Now, if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work what sort it is. We are required to be laborers in God's vineyard. We are required to work diligently every day. And to be classified as one of God's workers, and every Christian is supposed to be a worker for the Lord, we must say likewise, let us rise up and live. John chapter 9, verse 4, Jesus said, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day, and I come when no man can work. Jesus was a worker. Luke 19, verse 10, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. This is the work that Jesus came to do. And when Jesus left this earth, he left us instructions for continuing the work that he had begun. We, we all know what the Great Commission passages are, and, and you really don't need me to tell you what they are, but we're going to repeat one of them tonight in Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Jesus said, All power has been given unto me in heaven and in earth, Go ye therefore, teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded them. Go on with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. And this is the work that, that Jesus left for us to do. That spiritual work is to go out and teach the lost. The giving of that great commission is what he reminded us of that then. Jesse reminded us Saturday that, that uh, our door knocking, going out and trying to reach those that are lost, is not, uh, it's not a program that we're engaged in, but it is who we are. I would, I would add to that that it is who we are because it is who Jesus said that we are to be. We are to be laborers in God's vineyard. Let us rise up and build. Let's go back to Nehemiah for a minute. We 
continue through the book of Nehemiah, we find out that there are there were there are those who was, was, was trying to hinder the work that Nehemiah and those who were left in Jerusalem were trying to do. And there will be those who will try to hinder us. Satan being number one on that list. Nehemiah chapter four. Verses 1 through 6 says, It came to pass that when Sanballat heard that we built the wall, he was wroth and took great indignation and mocked the Jews. And he spake before his brethren in the army of Samaria and said, What do these feeble Jews? Will they fortify themselves? Will they sacrifice? Will they make an end in a day? Will they revive the stones out of the heaps of the rubbish which are burned? Now Tobiah the Ammonite was by him, and he said, Even that which they build, if the flocks go up, he shall even break down their stone wall. Hear, O God, Nehemiah speaking now, Hear, O God, for we are despised, and turn their reproach upon their own head, and give them for a prey in the land of captivity, and cover not their iniquity, and let not their sin be blotted out from before thee. For they have provoked thee to anger before the building. So built we the wall, all the wall was joined together unto the half thereof, for the people had a mind to work. That should be our mind, our mindset. We should have a mind to work. And even though Nehemiah and these folks from Jerusalem, they didn't let anything stop them, neither did anything stopped Sam Bella and his crew of, of trying to stop them from building that wall. Let's go over to uh, chapter 6 verses 1 through 5 we, we can read there now it came to pass when Sam Bella and Tobiah and Gisham and the Arabian and the rest of our enemies heard that I had built the wall that they were there was no no breach left therein, though at the time I had not set up the doors upon the gates. That Sanballat and Geshem sent unto me, saying, Come, let us meet together in some one of the villages in the plain of Ono, that they thought to do me mischief. They were coming at him again. We're going to see how many times they did come at him. I'm sure they didn't stop at that. Verse 3 says, I, I sent a messenger unto them, saying, I'm doing a great work so that I cannot come down. Why should the work cease whilst I leave it and come down to you? Yet they sent unto me four times after this sword, and I answered them after the same manner. They just kept coming at it. But the wall continued to be continued being built. Verse 5 said, Then sat, sent Sam Ballard his servant unto me in like manner the fifth time with an open letter in his hand. So five times right there in the row Sam Ballot was trying to get the MI to stop, stop the work, the building of the wall. But they did not prevail. Look at verse 15 in, in chapter 6. It says, So the wall was finished in the 25th day of the month of Elah in 52 days. 52 days after, after uh, Nehemiah had surveyed the situation there in Jerusalem gathered up his workforce to finish that, that wall. It was complete. But we know that Sam Ballard didn't, didn't stop his trying to stop that building. When we look over in the book of Luke, we see that Jesus was tempted Satan. He was tempted for 40 days. Satan never prevailed. Luke chapter 4 verse 13 well, it, it gives us an indication that, that Satan didn't give up either even trying to tempt Jesus because it says when the devil had ended all the temptation he departed from him for a season and he intended to return and so Satan is never going to give up we don't ever need to give up on the work that we are commissioned to do. He, Satan is never going to give up on trying to 
Let's stop for a seat. Let us rise up and be in the book of John. Chapter 15. Talking about the, the vine and the branches. John chapter 15, verse, verse 8. Herein is my Father glorified that ye bear much fruit, so shall ye be my disciples. Then again in verse 16, ye, ha ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that ye should go and bring forth fruit, and that your fruit should remain. Whatsoever ye shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it to you. Our, our job that we have been commissioned with is to bear fruit. We're to bear fruit so that that fruit can have opportunity to obtain an eternity in heaven with God. We are to bear that fruit. If you're not building, you're hindering the growth of the church. There are many many opportunities to help build a section of the law. We have set in place evangelism, evangelism tools. We have set in place many works that can be done, teaching class, teaching Bible classes. And there are many things that we can do where you are not building the kingdom to grow the church. Tonight, you have never rendered obedience to the gospel's invitation. You have not yet begun to build. But if you can, through the hearing of the gospel's message, believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, repent of your sins, turn from those evil ways, turn to doing right, never go back to them, confess Jesus as the Son of God, confess him. For this audience, confessing the remainder of your days upon this earth, being the Son of God, being buried with Him in the watery grave of baptism, to rise to walk in His life, and you can be built for the Lord. If you are subject to the Lord's invitation this evening in any way, you need to come while we stand and have this evening.
Father, to lift you up into your high and holy place. We're thankful for all the many blessings that you pour out upon us daily. We're thankful for the building that we have to come to worship in. And we're thankful for those that, that work here, all those that teach. We pray that you'd continue to bless us, Father. Give us wisdom that we might do things in a way which please you. We're mindful of all those that have been mentioned tonight that are having ailments, sickness, and cancer. Pray that you would be with them and comfort them, Father. Pray that they would be well, to be according to thy will. I ask that you forgive us of our sins as we often sin against you, Father, and we fall short of your glory. We pray that you would forgive us when we have a mind of repentance and that we would have a mind to do better. I ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.